This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Welcome to this edition of Spotlight on the Word. What we want to encourage you to do more than anything is to know and love and obey the God of the Word. This is a basic introduction, a general overview to the Bible. And during the course of this study, you will come to love and appreciate our God more because God in the Bible has given us a book from Him and about Him and the relationship that He wants to have with you and with me. That's really what the Bible is all about. It's about the salvation of man to the glory of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in this particular session, we're going to be looking at the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. They're part of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the first big part of the Bible, and it consists of 39 books. These 39 books that make up the Old Testament and God's will for the Jews, for Israel, these 39 books can be broken into five basic classifications. The first one, the books of law, consisting of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then we come to the 12 books of history, the last three of which, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, will serve as the basis for our study at this time. But Joshua through Esther are the books of history. Then we come to five books of poetry. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Then we'll come to five major prophets. They're called major prophets because of their length. They tend to be longer books than the books that follow called the minor prophets. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then we come to 12 books commonly called the minor prophets. Again, not because their message is less important or less significant, but rather because they tend to be shorter, they tend to be more brief. As we look at the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, keep in mind this key word, if you will. The word is restoration. That's a word I'd like for you to remember when you think about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Because you see, in the book of Ezra, there is this sense of restoration. There is the restoration of the nation and the temple. That's what Ezra is about, the restoration of the nation and the people. Then we come to the book of Nehemiah. It too has the theme of restoration. The restoration of the walls around the city of Jerusalem and the restoration of a relationship of God's people with Him. That's so very important. And then we come to the book of Esther. Esther as well has this theme, restoration and it has to do with the restoration of God's people even while in a foreign land. We're going to look at each one of these books a little more thoroughly in the remaining time that we have to study together. So let's go to the book of Ezra. If you would look at Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1, you would see that the very first name mentioned in the book of Ezra takes you back to 2 Chronicles. The name is Cyrus. Cyrus. Cyrus would issue a decree. Cyrus the Persian, as a great leader of an empire at that particular time in history, in 539 B.C., would issue a decree 
that the Jews could return to their homeland. And he did this because the Lord was with him, the text goes on to say. When you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36, the concluding verses, when you consider Isaiah chapter 45 and Jeremiah chapter 45, Jeremiah chapter 25 rather, these passages are quite helpful to look at when we consider the role of Cyrus in giving this decree. But as we continue, let's outline the book of Ezra. It can be broken down into two basic parts. First of all, it can be dealt with a nation restored. A nation restored. And this would be the first six chapters of this book a nation restored. Because you see, after this decree is made by Cyrus in 539 B.C., some Jews begin to return to their homeland. In 538 B.C., 538 B.C., a group of Jews return under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, now that's a hard name to pronounce. It's an even harder name to spell. But Zerubbabel led God's people, a number of them, back to their homeland when they had been in captivity for some time to the Babylonians but were released by the Persians. This happens in the first couple of chapters of the book of Ezra. And then what ensues is this. In chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6, the temple is rebuilt. Upon arriving back to their homeland, the first order of business is we must rebuild the temple. And in chapter 3, the work commences of Ezra. In chapter 4, the work is opposed and halts for a while. In chapter 5, the work on the temple resumes. And in chapter 6, the work is completed. It is completed. The temple is rebuilt. Then we get on to chapters 7 to the end of the book of Ezra. And if the first part of the book of Ezra dealt with the nation restored, the second part, beginning here in chapter 7, deals with a people rededicated. A people rededicated. In about 458 B.C., Ezra would lead another group back to the Bible land, back to their homeland when they had been in captivity. This came in phases, you see, first with Zerubbabel and now with Ezra. Fewer people come with Ezra than had made the journey initially with Zerubbabel, but a number leave to go to their homeland nonetheless. And you read about this in Ezra chapter 7 and 8. Ezra is a great man. He is a wonderful servant of God. And a key verse of Ezra simply must be Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. Ezra set his heart to seek the will of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Oh, what a wonderful example for people today. How we need to set our hearts to seek God's will to do God's will and to teach God's will to others. Notice as we look at the book of Ezra in chapter 9. In chapter 9 there is a marvelous prayer and included in that prayer, incidentally, when you look at Ezra chapter 9, when you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, and when you look at Daniel chapter 9, there are marvelous prayers of confession offered to God. And so what we have here in Ezra chapter 9 is a prayer of confession. And when you look at Ezra 9 verses 13 and 14, the Word of God indicates in this prayer in Ezra chapter 9 that God had not dealt with them as their sins deserved. He had been merciful and He had provided a remnant to be saved, to be able to come back through all of the difficulties and turmoils that they had experienced. Oh, thank God for difficult times. 
It's one thing to thank God when times are good in our lives. But when you read Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, they remind us of the importance of being thankful to God even for the difficult times we face, the obstacles, the hurdles, oh, the times that can bring us such heartache. Because when we look at this, we are reminded that we can never walk in pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty look before the, before the fall. In Proverbs 8 and verse 13, the Bible says, pride and arrogancy do I hate. Difficult times remind us how desperately we really need the Lord. In John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. How true that is. How we need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Realizing that our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but of God. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 5. Sometimes, some occasions, like that of Ezra, like that of Nehemiah, like that of Esther. Times are so difficult that we simply must rely upon God. And then what happens when we trust and obey Him is so amazing, people simply know God must be part of it. Confession of sin is acknowledged in Ezra chapter 9. And then in Ezra chapter 10, there is cleansing from sin cleansing from sin. And one of the things that Ezra faces upon returning back to the homeland from captivity, there are mixed marriages, religiously mixed marriages. Now this had been a great problem with the people of God through the centuries. Recall how Solomon loved many foreign women and how they turned his heart away from God. 1 Kings chapter 11. Over and over we see this occurring in the history of the people of God. And Ezra is broken hearted over it. As a matter of fact, when he hears about it, according to Ezra chapter 9, he tears his garments off in humility and, and he pulls out his hair. Do we feel that way about sin? Oh friend, it is important to have a home, to have a marriage that has each person encouraging the other, the husband and the wife encouraging each other to love God and to go to heaven. Friend, I plead with you, please marry a Christian, but do more than that. Marry a faithful Christian who will help you go to heaven yourself. It simply will not do to have the devil as our father-in-law, will it? As we continue in this study, let's briefly go to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to Artaxerxes the king. That's what we see in chapter 1. But he is a Jew, Nehemiah is, and he hears of the state of Jerusalem. He hears of the condition of the people and the place and he is broken hearted. Again, a huge obstacle, a real difficulty has got to be dealt with. He is in a position of influence. He is in a position where he has the confidence of the king. One better have confidence in their cupbearer. Nehemiah intercedes in Nehemiah chapter 1. He intercedes for God's people. He prays when he hears about the dilapidated state of Jerusalem and how that Jerusalem has become the object of scorn to the enemies of God. And he waits for a time to ask Artaxerxes for permission to go to Jerusalem so that the name of the Lord would not be reproached anymore. In Nehemiah chapter 2, the word to keep in mind is investigation. After a certain amount of time, the time is just right and having prayed, Nehemiah asked Artaxerxes for permission 
to go to Jerusalem and the king allows him to do so and gives him all that he asks. He investigates the circumstances. He rides around the city. He sees its condition. And then in Nehemiah chapter 3, the word to keep in mind is the word cooperation. What Nehemiah does masterfully is this. He gets most of the people on board with the rebuilding of the walls. And really that's what Nehemiah chapters 1 through 7 are all about. The context of Nehemiah is about 444 B.C. So I want you to understand that Ezra and Nehemiah are going to overlap during some of the time as we study these books. There is the expression next to or beside that is repeated in Nehemiah chapter 3 over and over because Nehemiah gets the people to cooperate with what is being done in the rebuilding of the walls. You might be wondering why would that be so important? Because a city at that particular point in history was only as strong as the walls that protected it that kept safe what was inside and that kept one protected from things that might harm from without. You look at Nehemiah chapters 4 and 5 and the word to remember is opposition. No good work will go unopposed. And maybe that's a good way of evaluating a good work. Is there someone who speaks out against it? Are there those out there who would attempt to thwart it and to discourage it? There certainly were when it came to rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, especially a couple of individuals whose names were Sanballat and Tobiah, people who were not interested in the welfare of God's people, people who weren't interested in the way of God at all, simply their own ways. When you look at Nehemiah, consider Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. We built the wall because the people had a mind to work. And look at chapter 6 because chapter 6 deals with the completion of the wall. In Nehemiah 6 and verse 15, so we built that wall. And how long did it take? In 52 days, the people of God rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem, thereby protecting the people of God, the city that the temple was built in, and thereby honoring God's name. And this was so impressive that even the enemies of God and His people thought that God must be involved in it. Rebuilding the walls is just what the first part of the book is about. This is not simply a story about construction. Far more than that, it is a story about instruction and it is about reviving God's people. Look at Nehemiah chapters 8 through 13. In Nehemiah chapter 8 through 13, catch chapter 8. The word to remember is the word command. In Nehemiah 8 and verse 8, they read from the Word of God. And this is a reading that takes place from God's Word over several hours and people are standing in reverence as they hear the Word of God being read. They are undoubtedly moved by it. They have the Word read and the sense of it is given so that they understand. Oh friends, Real preaching and teaching of God's Word should enlighten and not confuse. The true teaching of God's Word gives the sense, it exposes, it brings to light the precious will of God to your law and to your testimony. If any speak not according to this, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20, preach. The Word, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. The whole counsel of God needs to be declared, Acts 20 and verse 27. That was true at the time of Nehemiah and it remains true in our own day and time. How there needs to be book 
chapter, verse, preaching and teaching. Uh, Thus says the Lord. Here's what God has to say. It's amazing how much the Word of God can really reflect on some of these comments of men that won't save one soul. You get to chapter 9 of the book of Nehemiah and the word is confession. Confession. Just like Ezra 9, you have here in Nehemiah 9 the idea of confession, a beautiful prayer of confession which speaks of God's desire to pardon Nehemiah 9 verse 17. Chapter 10 deals with the covenant and the covenant is renewed. The people of God renew their commitment to God. They rededicate themselves to God and His way. The walls have been rebuilt and now a relationship has been restored. There's been a sense of rededication and recommitting oneself to God. As we look at the closing verses of the book of Nehemiah, chapters 11, 12, and 13, there is the cities being dedicated to God, the city of Jerusalem and the outlying villages. There are civil reforms that are taking place. There is a house cleaning, literally and metaphorically, that takes place because Tobiah, one of the enemies of God and his work, has had a home in the temple, has had room in the temple. He is thrown out in Nehemiah 13. The Sabbath is again observed properly and there is an uh, an interest, a true desire for integrity in marriage and in the family. The problem again of intermarriage. People from different religious persuasions coming together, it created great havoc among God's people in the Old Testament. And the fact is, people who have such different and uh, unrelated views of God and His Word that come together today, it doesn't do a home a great deal of good. We need homes, we need marriages that are based upon God and His precious will. After God, after all, God is the master architect of marriage and the family. Now we come to the book of Esther The name of God is not found one time in the book of Esther. And while God's name may not be found in the book, God permeates every sentence, every page, because it deals with the restoration of God's people in a foreign land. As we look at the book of Esther, it's taking place around 483 B.C. to 473 B.C., which would put it in the same general time frame as Ezra and Nehemiah. It takes place in Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. The ruler's name is Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. And when we look at the book, There are so many great truths to see, to embrace. But when we look at the book of Esther, we can break the book down as follows. Danger, chapters 1 through 4. Deliverance, chapters 5 through 10. Danger, 1 through 4. Deliverance, chapters 5 through 10. Now let's look a little more closely at the book. We have the vices of Ahasuerus in chapter 1. He is having a party. There is drinking. There is carousing. There is a lot of food. And he wants his wife Vashti to come out and to show herself, to display herself to all the guests. And Vashti, much to her credit, was a woman of modesty and she wouldn't go out and flaunt herself before all of the king's guests. And he was angry and decided it was time to put her away and to have a new wife. And that's chapter 2. 
we see the virtues, the virtues of Esther. There is something of a beauty contest being held in Esther chapter 2, the winner of which would become the queen, Ahasuerus' wife. And you read this chapter and it, it extols the virtues of Esther and what a great and godly woman she was. In chapter 3, we read of the vindictiveness of a man by the name of Haman. Haman was one of the leaders of the government under King Ahasuerus. Haman was one of the leaders of the government and he was full of himself. He was full of pride. He was arrogant. And on one occasion as he traveled, a man by the name of Mordecai did not bow down before him. And Haman was very upset. Haman was so upset that he found out that Mordecai was a Jew and determined to not just kill Mordecai, but to exterminate the entire nation. And so a plot is brought by uh, Haman to the king, Ahasuerus, to rid the nation and the world because of the power of the Persian Empire of all the Jews. Then we come to chapter 4 and the vision of Mordecai. Mordecai looks at this entire circumstance. He has heard what might be about to occur as the days go by to the Jews that they would be wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth. And there is the key verse here of this great book, Esther. Who knows, but for such a time as this you were appointed. Esther 4, 14 through 16. In chapters 5, through 10, there is deliverance. A plan is devised whereby Esther would go to her husband and say, let's have a feast and we're going to honor the one that you deem most worthy. Haman, being so full of himself, thought that he would be the one most worthy of the king's honor. But when you look at Esther chapter 6 and verse 1, here's God and His providence. During a sleepless night, the king recalled that there was a man by the name of Mordecai who had done him a good turn, who had saved his life in essence. And he wondered if anything good had ever been done for that man. And it turns out that there had not. In the course of the feast, it is revealed that Haman has this plan of exterminating all of the Jews and Esther is a Jewess herself. She is a Jew herself. When the king finds out about this, he is outraged. Eventually what happens in the book of Esther is that Haman hangs from the very gallows he had prepared for Mordecai to hang from. And Mordecai would eventually live in the very home that belonged to Haman. What a relief it was for God to be working providentially. It was said long ago by Joseph in Genesis 50 and verse 20, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In Romans 8 and verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. God takes care of those who love Him and those who obey Him. The book of Esther reminds us of that glorious truth. No matter how difficult or hard times may be, our God is greater than the problems we face.